Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining me here today at Rewritten Vintage Homestead. It is cold outside today. And you know what? I was thinking it's been quite a while since we've done a, an American history episode. You guys know how much I love American history. So I thought we would uh, discuss something that's been in the news this week. Uh, something that happened many years ago, but it's got a new spin on it. So let's talk about the Lindbergh baby kidnapping. In 1919, New York hotel owner Raymond Orteg offered a $25,000 prize for the completion of the first nonstop flight between New York and Paris. Charles Lindbergh was an American aviator and military officer who decided to seek out financial backing to compete for the coveted prize. On May 20, 20th and the 21st of 1927, he made the first solo transatlantic nonstop flight from New York City to Paris, a distance of 3,600 miles, flying for 33 and a half hours in his aircraft, the Spirit of St. Louis. Barely two months after Lindbergh arrived in Paris, he wrote an autobiography entitled We, which sold out before it was released publicly. His achievement created significant global interest in both commercial aviation and airmail, which revolutionized the aviation industry worldwide. Lindbergh was honored as the first time magazine man of the year when he appeared on that magazine's cover at the age of 25 in 1928. He toured all 48 states at that time with his plane, the Spirit of St. Louis. He was an intelligent, adventurer, military man, and handsome, and very quickly became wildly popular. Earl was the daughter of Dwight Moore a financial advisor to Lindbergh. He was also the U.S. ambassador to Mexico in 1927. Lindbergh was invited by Morrow to tour Mexico on a Goodwill tour in 1927. And it was during that time that Charles met Anne. They married in 1929. Lindbergh taught Anne how to fly and she accompanied and assisted him in much of his exploring, charting of air routes and radio communications. The Lindberghs decided they wanted to raise their family far away from the public spotlight of celebrity and they moved to a very large country estate in New Jersey. Their first child, Charles Lindbergh Jr., was born in 1930, one year after the start of the Great Depression. So you can imagine uh, how people in the United States felt. It was a very hard time for uh, Americans financially but they loved Charles Lindbergh. He was America's golden boy. And now he had a son and it was very exciting. Uh, baby Charlie was suffering from a cold on Tuesday, March 1st, 1932. Betty Gow, Charlie's nurse, rubbed medication on the baby's chest to relieve his congestion and made a flannel shirt for him out of one of her nightgowns. At about 7.30 that evening, Betty and Anne put Charlie Jr. to bed. At 10 p.m., Betty made a horrible discovery. Baby Charlie was gone. Charles Lindbergh later reported, I went upstairs to the child's nursery, opened the door, and immediately noticed a lifted window. A strange-looking envelope laid on the sill. I looked at the crib, and it was empty. I ran downstairs, grabbed my rifle, and went out into the night. The strange looking envelope that Charles Lindbergh found on the windowsill contained a badly written ransom note. Dear Sir, have 50,000 ready, 25,000 in $20 bills, 15,000 in $10 bills, and 10,000 in $5 bills. After two to four days, we'll inform you where to deliver the money, M O N Y. We warn you from making any ding. A-N-Y-D-I-N-G, any ding, public, 
or for notify the police, P-O-L-I-S-E, the child is in GUT, G-U-T, care. So we warn you from making any ding public or for notify the police, the child is in GUT care. What would you immediately think? It's German. And within a half an hour that night, radio stations were announcing the story to the nation. Now, this is a very interesting piece of trivia, American trivia. Colonel H. Norman Schwarzkopf of the New Jersey State Police was officially in charge of the investigation. But Schwarzkopf, who was the father of 1991 Gulf War leader U.S. General H. Norman Schwarzkopf, isn't that interesting? Willingly handed over much of the investigation to Charles Lindbergh. Can you imagine? I mean, think about the John Benet Ramsey case. So, this child has been murdered, and the Colorado police bumbled that case like you wouldn't have it by letting people in and out and in and out of the house, and the parents roam freely around the house as they wanted. It was actually uh, uh, Mr. Ramsey, who found John Benet down in the basement, but to hand over the entire investigation to her father would be ridiculous, wouldn't it? But because of his prestige and the admiration that everyone had for him, th there was no question about it. Uh, so they let him lead the investigation into the kidnapping of his own son. Someone is very interested in the story. <laughs> then on May 12, 1932, 72 days after the kidnapping, the decomposed body of a baby was found in the woods near the Lindbergh home. The child had been dead probably due to a fractured skull since the night of the kidnapping. Two days later, Charles Lindbergh identified his son's baby by examining the baby's teeth. Now, he did that on his own, examined the baby's teeth. Also, the, uh, the flannel shirt that Betty had made for the baby because of his cold was found, and they identified the baby that way. The kidnapping investigation was now a murder investigation and it became known as the crime of the century for that century. Just like Lizzie Borden was the crime of her century, O.J. Simpson was the crime of his century, this was the crime of their century. So they set up headquarters in the Lindbergh home. John Condon was a 72-year-old retired teacher and coach from the Bronx, and he called the Lindberghs claiming that he had contacted the kidnapper. What he had done was he put an ad in the Bronx Home News offering to act as a go-between between, between the Lindberghs and the kidnapper. The day after his letter was published, someone claiming to be the kidnapper contacted him. They would meet him in a graveyard and different locations, and those took place while Charles Lindbergh waited by in a nearby car. The kidnapper gave Condon a note detailing the location of the baby after money was exchanged, and the note led Lindbergh and Condon in search of a boat called the Nelly, but no boat and the baby were never found. Eleven more ransom letters were delivered to the Lindberghs, and all were to be determined that they were written by the same person of German descent. After a while, serial numbers from the money used to pay the ransom had been carefully recorded and they started surfacing in New York only three days after the ransom was paid. Over the next two years, more and more money would appear, which enabled authorities to track the kidnappers' movements. Finally, on September 19, 1934, police arrested Bruno Richard Hauptmann, a German-born carpenter. A search of Hopman's home uncovered $14,000 of the Lindbergh ransom money. He claimed he was holding it for a friend who had since died. But despite his pleas of innocence, Hopman was indicted in October 1934 for the murder of Charles Lindbergh Jr. The much-anticipated trial of the century got underway in 1935. 
60,000 people. Reporters, novelists, movie stars crammed into the tiny Flemington, New Jersey town where the trial would take place. Both Charles and Anne Morrow Lindbergh were called as witnesses. Charles testified he recognized Hopman's voice from the night that he and Condon had delivered the ransom money to the cemetery. And when Hopman took the stand, he denied all involvement with the crimes. He went on to say that he'd been beaten by police and forced to alter the way he wrote so that his handwriting matched the ransom note. Following 11 hours of deliberation, the jury found him guilty of murder in the first degree, and he was sentenced to death. And at 8.44 p.m. on April 3rd, 1936, Bruno Richard Hopman was put to death in the electric chair. The case again against Hopman was truly the first case where extensive forensic science was used. Of course, there was no DNA at the time, no video cameras, no voice recorders. Uh, but some of the evidence was the, the ladder, there was a ladder that was placed outside the Lindbergh's home that went right to the baby's room and the window was lifted. The ladder was a homemade ladder and it had been broken. They brought in experts in carpentry and in wood and they were able to identify what type of wood was used the way the grain went, I mean, really extensively. And when they did a search of Hopman's home, they found boards that had been ripped up that were used to make a ladder. Handwriting and voice experts were also used during the trial. And it was determined by the coroners that the baby had died from a blow to the head, which probably happened when the ladder broke and Hopman was coming down the ladder, the baby hit its head on the ground and died instantly. Now, this is how the controversy, uh, today's controversy has started. So in 2020, a retired judge named Lisa Perlman, she wrote a book that builds on a theory that's been around for decades, that Charles Lindbergh himself was the kidnapper and that the wrong man was executed. Conspiracy theory, right? This year, just recently, the San Francisco Chronicle discussed Perlman's book and her arguments have created a new wave of interest in the case. So some of the main points that Perlman hit on was that there was a French uh, surgeon who was a friend of the Lindbergh's named Alex Carroll. He and Charles Lindbergh were working on inventing the first perfusion pump, a device that was created with making future heart surgeries and organ transplants possible. So using the information gleaned from medical reports on the kidnapping in the dead baby's body, New Jersey State Police files and papers written by Lindbergh, there are extensive papers written by Lindbergh. So there's really no um, deliberation as to what he believed uh, in politics and that type of thing, because he wrote many books, many journals, um, but Perlman believes that uh, he may have offered his son to Carol to see what they could uh, preserve, uh, to see if they could preserve living organs outside of the body long enough to be transplanted. That type of preservation would have revolutionized surgery in the 1930s. Perlman suggests using medical writings and photos by Carol and others that Carol or his team may have removed a thyroid or part of an artery from young Charles leading to his death, and then concocted a kidnapping hoax to cover up the crime. Perlman states, I think Carol conducted the operation with Lindbergh's permission, and Lindbergh was likely present at the operation. Now that may sound far-fetched and crazy, but let's remember Lindbergh identified his own son by doing a dental examination on the dead baby. Herman also uh, argues that historians have long noted that Lindbergh and Carroll were both advocates of eugenics. Eugenics is the weeding out of human deficiencies so that they can't be inherited. And the Lindbergh baby was known to be sickly and have an abnormally large head. Now that is of other people's opinions. I don't think there's any writings by Charles Lindbergh about his child having a large head. 
but Perlin contends that to Lindbergh, the child, the child may have been disposable. Two months prior to the baby's kidnapping, Lindbergh pretended the child had been kidnapped and allowed his panic-stricken household to search for half an hour before he revealed he had hidden the baby in the trash closet. So Perlman argues that it was just a dry run for things to come. But things started to change. We were coming out of the Great Depression and going into World War II. Like I said, Lindbergh was very vocal on his political feelings and things about eugenics, which he did talk quite a bit about. He was a scientist. He uh, volunteered a lot of times for science and didn't charge any money. He was a very wealthy man. But after the trial, uh, he and his wife secretly went on a ship and moved to Europe, and no one knew they were gone <laughs> until, you know, about a week after. And, you know, that was kind of upsetting to some Americans that he decided to leave. But there was just so much uh, surrounding them that they, they couldn't escape it anymore. And they needed some peace and quiet in their lives. But when, when World War II started, um, Lindbergh was not very vocal on the side of the United States joining that war. Also, he, he was not very vocal in criticizing what Germany and Hitler were doing to Jews. And that turned a lot of people off. Now, he was what you would call a nationalist. He believed in America first. And he didn't want America drawn into a war. Now, you can see that back then, Americans didn't like it because, by golly, we should go over there and we should join in to the war. Um, we need to take care of Hitler. Uh, we need to take care of Germany. He argued that the whole reason Germany was the way it was and was able to fall under Hitler was because Britain and France did not support them financially after World War I. So they had so much poverty and lack of a national identity that it was easy for someone to come in and swoop in and take over like that. And he was, he was probably right on, on that. Um, but think about things in today's world. How can we, how can we uh, you know, compare that to what's going on today? Well, let's look at Ukraine. And I think it's safe to say at the beginning of the war in Ukraine, which was two years ago, almost everybody said, yes, we have to help them. We have to help them against Russia. We have to help them financially. We have to do everything we can. This poor country is being invaded. But two years later, a lot of people are saying, where's the money? You know, where has the United States has given billions and billions to this cause? And some people want to know, where is it? We want an accounting of where this money has gone. Why isn't this war over? Why is it still dragging on if we've been helping this much? And sometimes people with that type of view are accused of being pro-Russia uh, because they don't want to get involved in that war. So there, there are comparisons of then to today. There was also apparently a period of time between the late 50s and the early 60s that Charles was doing a little bit of full philandering. <laughs> he had several children with a German woman. He had several children with her sister. And then he had several children with a woman from Prussia who worked as his secretary. I think there was three, four, five, seven children during that time that were born to other women that his wife did not find out about until after he had passed away. So that has kind of helped to, you know, tarnish the image of Lindbergh as well. You know, to me, it's, it's kind of like, have you ever met somebody who's so intelligent and so smart that they have absolutely no common sense? That that's kind of, that's how Lindbergh kind of seems to me. <laughs> This was a terrible, terrible story in our American history. So sad. Such a sad ending for probably um, 
a baby who was going to grow up and be a celebrity himself. And who knows what he could have done in the fields of science and aviation uh, under the watchful eye of his uh, father. So it was a very sad time in American history. But I thought this was uh, very interesting. And um, I saw it come back up in the news last week. And I thought, well, let's just touch on that and see what other people think, too. And I hope it encourages you to learn more about Charles Lindbergh and the different inventions that he helped to develop and pathways that he created for aviation. You guys, I hope you have a great week. Like, subscribe, and share. Let me know if you like this, this type of content. It's a lot of work. Believe me, it's a lot more work than just doing cooking videos, but I love it. I love American history, and I don't want us to forget it. Come back and see you.